I invite you to open your Bible with me to uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, if you've brought your Bible with you. We are uh, continuing this morning in our sermon series on the life of Elijah. And uh, in 1 Kings chapter 21, we come to the story of Naboth's vineyard. So hear now the word of the Lord from 1 Kings chapter 21. Now Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And after this, Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house, and I will give you a better vineyard for it. Or, if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. And Ahab went into his house, vexed and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal, she sent the letters to the elders and the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city, and she wrote in the letters, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth at the head of the people, and set two worthless men opposite him, and let them bring a charge against him, saying, You have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of his city, the elders, and the leaders who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them, as it was written in the letters that she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people. And the two worthless men came in and sat opposite him. And the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. And so they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. And then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned. He is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead. Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab king of Israel, who is in Samaria, Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dogs shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat, and anyone of his whose who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abom abominably in going after idols, as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. And when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days. But in his son's days, I will bring disaster 
upon his house. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask this morning that you would help us to humble ourselves before you and to come before your word in humility. Lord, we do not want to set ourselves above your word, but we want to set your word above ourselves and to submit to your word. And yet so often we find ourselves doing the exact opposite. So this morning, Lord, help us to humble ourselves before you and underneath the authority of your word. And we pray that you would teach us as we continue to study the life of your servant, your prophet Elijah. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was reflecting on the story here, which I have read many times, and one of the things that occurred to me is the fact that some of the most serious sins in the Bible came about when people allowed their eyes to gaze at the wrong things for too long. So if you think about it with me, it goes all the way back to the, the garden where Eve decided to gaze at this forbidden fruit and she allowed her gaze to be fixed upon it and saw that it was desirable to eat. And so what did she do? Well, she couldn't restrain herself from taking a bite and she and Adam both ate it. Or how about Abraham's nephew Lot? I don't know if you remember, but Lot's troubles started when he was looking towards Sodom. He was gazing towards Sodom and he saw that the land looked fertile and nice and he couldn't help himself and so he decided to live near Sodom. He pitched his tents near Sodom and then ended up actually living in Sodom. King David got in trouble when he was gazing at the wrong things and he was gazing at a woman from his rooftop, and before long he was engaged in the sin of adultery. You could go on and on and on. The eyes gaze at the wrong things and end up getting us into trouble. Maybe that's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So today... We come across another person whose eyes got him into trouble, and that's Ahab. Ahab's gaze was not captured by food, and it wasn't captured by land, and it wasn't captured by women, but it was captured by a vineyard. At its heart, this story is about Ahab's gaze at this vineyard that he wanted, and it's about his covetousness for this thing that did not belong to him. You know, Jesus warned in Luke 12, 10, he said, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Well, hopefully by looking at Ahab's covetousness, we can learn a few things and not fall into that same trap ourselves. But I want to look this morning at Ahab and this covetousness that was in his heart and see what is revealed about it. So first thing we can look at is what, what was the roots of Ahab's covetousness? Verses 1 through 2, look at them with me again. It says, Now Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And after this, Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house, and I will give you a better vineyard for it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. Now, one of the first roots... Of one of the primary roots of covetousness is discontent or discontentment with what you have. Think about this with me for a minute. Ahab would have had a lot. This is he is the king, so he would have had lots of money. He would have had lots of wealth. He would have had the finest food and clothing. He would have had servants. Oh, and by the way, he would have had vineyards of his own. Because did you notice it said, Give me your vineyard and I'll give you another one for it? It wasn't that he didn't have a vineyard. He wanted that one, this specific one. I says, I'll give you a better vineyard for it if you give me yours. You see, he had so much already, but he was discontent with what he had. He wanted something else. He wanted something more. And I'll tell you, one of the primary roots of covetousness is discontentment. Rather than giving thanks to God for what he had, he was focused on what he didn't have. 
Um, he was probably always discontent because uh, he, he, he always wanted something more. You know, so, so much of the frustration that we have in our lives comes from wanting things that God has not given us. It's not that God hasn't given us anything. He's given us lots of things, but we tend to focus more on what he hasn't given us than what he has given us. And so we say to ourselves those two little words that create so much discontentment in our lives, if only. If only. You know, if only I made more money. If only my house was a little bit bigger. If only I had a better job. If only I had a happier family life. Then maybe I would be happy. You know, the problem is that all of those statements assume that our contentment is based upon our external circumstances. And the problem is so often when our external circumstances change, we find something new to be discontent about. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Even when we somehow uh, receive what we might want, then there's something else that we don't have that we find to make ourselves miserable. Ahab was discontent because all he could see was what he didn't have. He didn't have this vineyard next to his palace, and he wanted that particular vineyard, and the discontent became covetousness, and that began to take over his heart. If we're not careful, discontent can take over our own hearts as well. So these are the roots of Ahab's covetousness. Well, let's then look at what were the fruits of his covetousness. What did this produce? Well, we know that Naboth would not give up his vineyard. And he, he wouldn't give it up, not because he was stubborn, but because he was righteous. Um, in the law of Moses, Israelites were not permitted to sell their property in perpetuity. And the reason for that was because of an understanding that the land actually belonged to the Lord. And it was to remain in the tribes to which it had been allotted, and therefore you could not sell land in perpetuity. It was forbidden in the law of Moses. And Naboth knew this, and therefore he would not sell his land. He was choosing to follow God's law rather than what the king wanted. So what did Ahab do when he couldn't have his heart's desire? Well, verse 4 says, Ahab went into his house, vexed and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him, and he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. He moped. <laughs> Have you ever met an adult that has the demeanor of a toddler? <laughs> Don't answer that question. Um, <laughs> might hit a little too close to home. Um, the reality is that even people who are fully grown can have the maturity of children, particularly when they don't get what their heart is attached to and they want it. This is the problem with covetousness. It takes over your heart. And when you let that desire control your heart to such an extent that you make your happiness dependent upon that thing, then you will end up dissatisfied with everything else in your life. In fact, one of the fruits that we see here of, of his covetousness, one of the fruits is uh, dissatisfaction. He, he wasn't happy with anything else that he had because his heart was controlled by that one desire. But that wasn't the only fruit. Um, his covetousness produced more sin in his life. It, it gave birth to rotten fruit, which is just more sin. Um, after Ahab's wife found out about what happened, she hatched a scheme. Now, you could blame this whole thing on Jezebel, but the reality is, as you read the whole chapter, uh, Ahab was complicit in the whole thing as well. It wasn't just her, it was both of them together. Uh, they proclaim a fast with prominent leaders, and they invite Naboth to attend this fast. During the fast, they hire two worthless kind of scoundrels to sit on either side of Naboth and accuse him of cursing God and the king. Well, then, of course, uh, cursing God was an offense that was blasphemy and would have been punishable by death. And so once he was accused of this, they take him out and they stone him to death. And then here's what happens after that. Verse 15, as soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, 
Ahab arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. You know, earlier this summer, um, we did a series called Peacemakers, and during one of those messages, I talked about how idols can take control of our hearts. And I talked about the progression of an idol and how it progresses in our hearts. And I want to revisit that for a minute because this story is such a vivid illustration of the progression of an idol and how it works. Think about it with me. I said earlier this summer, we said, it begins with a desire, right? Ahab had a desire. His desire was to have Naboth's vineyard. Now, that wasn't an inherently evil desire. There are a lot of desires we have that aren't inherently evil, but... The question is, what happens when we don't get the desire that we want? We have two options at that point. We can either trust God and be satisfied in him and, and be at peace with the fact that he hasn't given us that, or we can allow that desire to continue to control our hearts, and that's what Ahab did. He allowed his desire to control him. So then secondly, desire leads to demand. Ahab didn't just want the vineyard. He was convinced that he needed the vineyard, and he decided that his own personal happiness was dependent upon that vineyard. I'm guessing some of us have made this mistake before. We want something so bad that we've come to the point where whether we recognize it or not, we've, we've, or we're acting as if our personal happiness is dependent upon getting that thing. Desire turns into demand. Paul Tripp puts it this way. He says, how often do we live with a sense of need for things we do not need at all? How much does this change the way we view ourselves, our lives, others, and God? How much envy, discouragement, bitterness, and doubt of God comes from being convinced that we are being denied the things we need to live life as it was meant to be lived? This silent and often unseen war for the heart is taking place all the time. Desire leads to demand, and then demand produces expectation. Ahab was convinced that he needed the vineyard, and therefore he expected Naboth to give him the vineyard. If I'm convinced I need something, I'm going to do everything in my power to get it. And that quickly begins to affect my relationship with others, because if you have the power to give me what I think that I need, and you don't give it to me, well, then that's going to destroy the relationship. So then fourth, when other people fail to meet our expectations, this leads to disappointment. We're disappointed in them. You know, a lot of times in life, our disappointment comes not because people have wronged us truly, but because they've failed to meet our own warped expectations. When we operate with the assumption that our desires, our needs, and that others are responsible to help us meet those needs, then that leads to anger toward them when they fail to do it. So Ahab was so angry... He, fit, he, he wouldn't eat any food. And then disappointment leads to what? It leads to punishment. When others disappoint me, then I seek to punish them because they have hurt me. And that can take many different forms. It could be lashing out at others. It could be withdrawing from others. In Ahab's case, it was much more extreme than that. He and his wife hatched a scheme to kill Naboth. What this reveals is that the idol had taken complete control of his heart. This is the fruit of covetousness. And as I hope you can see, it's rotten fruit that it produces. And this is why the Bible calls us over and over again to beware of covetousness. Paul says in Colossians 3, we read these verses earlier, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and, and, he says, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. If we don't put covetousness to death in our lives, then it will put us to death. So these are the fruits of his covetousness. What are the consequences of Ahab's covetousness then? Verse 17, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise and go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he's in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In a place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. Boy, we could look at this and say, this seems awfully gruesome. 
And it is. But it's a reminder that God is not indifferent to extreme wickedness. And although God is patient and forbearing, he will not ignore extreme wickedness. And those who take advantage, like Ahab took advantage of the innocent, will face judgment. So Elijah comes to him, and in verse 20, Ahab says to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And I love that line. Have you found me? Well, of course he found him. Because you can't hide from the Lord, and you can't hide your sin from the Lord. You can hide your sin from everybody else, but you can't hide it from the Lord. And he went to take possession of the vineyard, and it was sort of like Elijah was just waiting there for him sitting there, ready to confront him. And it's interesting that he calls Elijah his enemy because that tells you something about the condition of his heart. It's only because Ahab is comfortable in his sin that he could consider a prophet of God to be his enemy. Only a person who's set himself up in rebellion against God would consider God's prophet to be an enemy. But that's exactly Ahab's perception. So Elijah says in verse 20, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. He didn't just do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, he sold himself. Essentially, it's as if Elijah is saying, this idol took control of your heart so strongly that you sold your soul to try to attain this thing. So what would be the consequences? Verse 21 says, Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond, or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, The dogs shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. And anyone of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. As we said earlier, God is not indifferent to wickedness. And he will not withhold his judgment forever. That should be a great comfort to every single person who looks at the world today. And you can see all around the world, including in our own country, people who commit egregious acts of wickedness against others. And sometimes people wonder, how can God be indifferent to such things? He's not indifferent to it, and although he withholds his judgment out of mercy, he will not withhold his judgment forever. And this story makes that very, very clear. In fact, if you read through the book of 2 Kings in chapters 9 and 10, you can see that every single one of these prophecies of judgment is fulfilled. When Jehu comes and sets out to kill every last member of Ahab's family. These are the consequences of Ahab's covetousness. But I want to end here by talking lastly about the cure for his covetousness. Because the story ends on an actually very surprising note. And the surprise is that Ahab, who's basically been nothing but wicked for his, the entire story of Elijah actually repents. Look at verse 27. It says, When Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Ahab was, has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days I will bring the disaster upon his house. And that's where the chapter ends. This is very, very unexpected. And what are we to make of this? Well, some people conclude that this was a phony repentance, that Ahab wasn't actually repentant, that he was just making a show of repentance, that it was an external repentance, but that in his heart he was not truly repentant. I don't agree with that, though. I, I tend to think this was actually a sincere repentance, at least in this moment. And I think that for one simple reason, and that's because the Lord seems to say it was sincere. 
The Lord says to Elijah, did you notice how Ahab has humbled himself before me? And then he, he, he delays the punishment that is coming. He doesn't remove it, but he delays it. And I just assume that since the Lord can see into the human heart, if this was a false humility, the Lord would have called him out on it, as he does on many other occasions in Scripture. But he doesn't do that. He seems to commend Ahab's humility at this moment. And so I want to just say this is a reminder that one, the, the, the first step to curing the covetousness of our hearts is to recognize it and repent of it. To acknowledge before the Lord that we have coveted whatever it may be and to repent of it before the Lord. I believe Ahab did do that and that's why the Lord delayed the punishment. But there's another step to curing covetousness and that's that we cannot just repent of our idols. We have to replace them. You cannot just repent and, and, and acknowledge your own uh, uh, sinfulness in terms of covetousness and, and be sorry for it. We, we need to have our idols replaced because that's the only way that they will no longer control our hearts as if they're replaced with something else. And that's where Ahab failed. Because if you read on, it becomes fairly clear that although it seems that his repentance in this moment was genuine, you go into chapter 22 and following, and it seems that Ahab is still consulting false prophets. He still has not given up false gods. And ultimately, he was put to death for that. He was judged by God for that. He was killed in battle. And Ahab's life should serve as a warning to all of us of the dangers of covetousness if we allow it to control our hearts. But I want to end by asking this question. Why did God show mercy to Ahab in this moment? Again, he didn't remove the punishment. He just delayed it. But he delayed it nonetheless. And he did show mercy to Ahab. Why would God show mercy to such a man? We have seen nothing, nothing good about this king. <laughs> Not only over the last several chapters has there been no example of righteousness from this king, but look at what verse 25 says. It says, There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols, as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. Based on that description, Ahab did not deserve any mercy from the Lord. That's the definition of mercy, isn't it? You don't ever deserve mercy. Why did the Lord show him mercy? Well, maybe it was to remind us that none of us deserve any mercy from the Lord either. You know, we're all a lot more like Ahab than we would like to admit. We all have a tendency in the sinfulness of the human heart to gaze at the wrong things, to covet what the Lord has not given, and to allow idols to take control of our hearts. If we deny that that's the case, we're really deluding ourselves. So we're all a lot more like Ahab than we would like to admit. But Ahab's story reminds us that God gives mercy and grace for every single sinner who repents and who trusts in Jesus Christ. And ultimately, that is the only way to be saved from our own covetousness, is to repent and turn to Jesus Christ and to replace the idols that we have within our heart with Jesus. So I want to close this morning with these words from Philip Graham Ryken. He says, The mercy of God cannot be explained, but it can be received. King Ahab received free grace because he was a needy sinner. If we are sinners too, serving the wrong master, waiting in the vineyard for our sins to find us out, it is not too late for us to repent. It was not too late for Ahab, and if it was not too late for him, it is never too late for anyone. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, 
we thank you for your mercy in our lives. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we recognize when we're honest with ourselves that we do not deserve anything from you except judgment. We recognize that the wages of sin is death. And that is what we have earned for our record. But we thank you, O Lord, that the free gift, the free gift that you have given is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, we, help, we ask that you would help us to daily die to ourselves, that you would help us to repent of our sins, to trust in you, and that you would replace all the idols of our hearts with a love for you above all things. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.